Good afternoon and welcome to um, this session at uh, the 2013 Linux Conference. Our first speaker is Anton Blanchard. Anton works for the IBM Linux Technology Centre. He spends a, a lot of his time looking for the elusive go fast bit for customers in various states of panic, from embedded devices right up to supercomputers. No problem, too small or too big. Thanks, Anton. Thanks, Steve. So who thinks systems are getting more and more complicated and harder and harder to debug and analyze? All of us, I think. And the tools really aren't catching up, keeping up with what we have to debug. Often the challenge now is to really decompose a problem between so many different levels, and the levels are only increasing. Uh, we do the application, the compiler, the middleware layer. Now we've got hypervisors, we've got more and more firmware layers, and then we've got the obvious ones of CPU, memory, and I.O. So things are definitely getting more and more complicated. So what I thought today is run through some of the tools that I use, some of the processes I use for debugging performance problems, uh, just to show and hopefully uh, educate some of us on some maybe better ways of, of analysing things. I think performance is something you always continue to learn. I'm still learning. I still make a lot of mistakes. Uh, so I'll start, uh, we'll start simple with some simple tools and then we'll build up into the more complex ones. So if you had a performance problem, what would you be your go-to tool? What, what do you think you'd attack with? D-Trace. We won't be talking about D-Trace. Anything else? Top. Top's a good one. H-Top, great. That's another great tool too. S-Trace, yes. Love S-Trace. A lot of those. All, those. all of the above. Perf. No one's mentioned Perf Events. The Swiss army knife of Linux uh, debugging and performance analysis. Profiler. Profiler, yeah. A bunch of tools. What's that? I love using, I love that, yes. And the advantage there is you get full dwarf based debug backtracing too, yeah. which with something like perf you don't always get. So yeah, I've definitely yeah. used use that in anger. <laughs> especially, I guess, a threaded one if you have to stop all of them. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. A, great, a great idea too, yeah. So we'll start simple. The, the first tool I might tend to use is uptime. And it tells you the number of processes that are running, ready to run, or blocked on I.O. Gives you a bit of an idea where it is. <laughs> Rule number one, 13,000, probably a little bit high. Oh, that was a machine we had in our test. The, the test teams at IBM really take their, their job seriously, and they love breaking <laughs> our stuff. So you know, with, with great honor that they come along and say, we've got a performance problem, the machine's almost dead, fix it. Um, it's running uptime's lightweight. With a lot of these performance problems, you'll find if you start using the more heavyweight tools, even things like Top, uh, we often have situations where we log into a machine and Top takes 30 minutes to display something. So obviously something wrong there, but at 30 minutes at a, a refresh rate isn't really going to give you anything useful. DMessage, back in the old days when we always to sit there and type in our consoles, we'd always look at DMessage. Well, the console print key buffer would spam us in the, in the face these days with X and remote machines. Not a lot of people look at it, uh, and a lot of the time that's the first place you should check, obviously. Simple stuff, but we often forget to. The, the catch or kind of the canary in the coal mine for a lot of bugs we have these days is basically when we get something like this I.O. stall, and it isn't necessarily an I.O. problem. It could be something else. But again, that's something to check for, and it's something um, you can then use to, to analyze what's going on. VMstat, the next one, someone mentioned VMstat. Very lightweight. Um, interesting story behind that tool, actually, because uh, it used to be somewhat more heavyweight, and um, there was this ancient benchmark from Speak called Estet, and it was terrible, terrible benchmark, but it was basically a terminal user benchmark, so all these people at university were sitting there typing on their terminals, and I guess when it stops responding, everyone starts typing VM stat. And so it was part of the benchmark. <laughs> and so, part of the benchmark, our job is to make benchmarks go faster, so we made VMstat go faster. <laughs> so it turns out that now VMstat, I think, only loads maybe a couple files in PROC, it's pretty, pretty, pretty much guaranteed to run. Another lightweight and good tool to use. Little plug for DSTAT, I like DSTAT. It's a, uh, a, a, pro, a, pro, a tool that basically amalgamates a bunch of different information. Um, you get you know, the complete breakdown of all your different levels of, of where time is being spent. Um, most people, there's a bunch of kernel people who are, this is second, second uh, complete knowledge to them. But for people that aren't, 
obviously you spend time in the user space, you can spend time in the system, in the kernel doing something. If you've got nothing to do, you're in idle time. Uh, and then you've also got wait time. Wait, wait time is a pretty awful metric because the absence of wait time doesn't mean you have an IO, you don't have an IO problem. Um, you can easily have something that's CPU bound but also has IO problems and it won't show up as wait time. Uh, but if you do see wait time, then it is a good sign that there's something you're blocking on IO and there's, there's something maybe you need to look at. Dave's smiling. There's no heckling there. Uh, do you want me to heckle? No, no, that's fine. Save it till later. <laughs> Uh, and then we get into like hard IQ and soft IQ. So hard IQ is usually the first part of an interrupt handler and its job is basically to do its work and get the hell out of there and then it might hand off to a soft IQ. So you get a nice breakdown there and then you know, a bunch of other stats. So like this, this is like a quick dashboard and you can kind of see how the machine's performing. We mentioned top, top's great. Uh, you know, hit one, you get this nice per CPU profile, uh, very useful. Um, as I said, prone to hacking, uh, not hacking, prone to hanging. <laughs> And someone mentioned HTOP, another great tool there, and that's just it running here in a, uh, a box and you've got, again, the breakdown. Uh, we'll talk a bit about stolen time as well. When we add hypervisors, we've got yet another level of time we keep, and that's called stolen time. Uh, but here you'll see you know, every CPU broken down with a lot of performance problems. If you look at the aggregates, if you look at the system-wide stats, it really won't tell you what's going on. In a lot of cases, it's a single CPU that might be blocking. So you you know, these kind of stats are useful because you can go in and potentially see one guy that's in trouble and then you can drill down on that. So I mentioned S-Trace, another great tool. Um, there is some interesting things going on. Um, Acme is working on some interesting things around Perf Trace that I might mention a bit later. But uh, you know, this is installed everywhere and, and um, very useful for look at, looking at latencies um, when uh, tasks block. And it's a bit of a contrived example of Sleep One. Looks like a contrived example, but we actually had an application a number of years ago uh, that was taking forever to run uh, and we looked into it and eventually some programmer put a sleep one in the middle of the call loop for unknown reasons. So, a bit crazy but it's actually a real, a real problem we found. Let's talk about Perth a bit. So Perth's really kind of the, uh, I guess the Swiss army knife of Linux performance analysis now. So a lot of the stuff that uh, that goes in to Linux to do performance analysis ends up in Perf. And I could talk for hours, but I won't on Perf. Um, I don't have the time. But we'll look at some of the, the best bits of Perf, I guess. What I think are the best bits of Perf anyway. You may, may not necessarily agree. Perf stat's probably the easiest place to start. So Perf stat is just a way of getting performance statistics. And it's both kernel statistics, it's also uh, uh, performance monitor statistics off the hardware. So you can basically drill down in either direction. Uh, the operating system ones, you can look at things like, you know, how much CPU time have I used, how many context switches have I had, how many page faults have I had, all that kind of interesting statistics. And then the hardware PMU stuff is, is application, or hardware CPU specific, but there's a wealth of, you know, often hundreds of these different events. Uh, at the moment, unfortunately, there's only a, a small section of kind of generic events where you can actually specify an event across CPUs, perhaps say a, a, a translation miss or a cache miss or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of people working on improving that, maybe adding more events. The other trick will be to actually have the per CPU specific events as well, because eventually, uh, it's somewhere where we, we really let down here compared to you know, most other commercial profiling products and even uh, some of the old ones like O-Profile, where you actually have the easy ability to use a symbolic name uh, for you know, a translation miss or, or a pipeline stall or something like that. The, the, the thing that lets us uh, get away with it at the moment, you can actually specify raw events. So if you actually know what the raw event is, you can program that guy in and profile on it. Uh, what I use, tend to use is libpfm uh, out of the perfmon2 um, suite, I guess has a set of tools you can use to, to, to take your CPU and look up events and stuff like that. So that's quite useful when you need to drill down. <coughs> Simple example, um, just kind of scaling a, a, an array here. Um, looks pretty boring. Uh, we allocate it statically, so it's in the DSS, and we walk through it. And potentially now we're going to look at this from a perf perspective. We're just running perf stat without any parameters at the moment, these are, these are at the moment the set of events that, we, uh, that we've decided to display by default. And you know, they've, 
looking, you start from the top and it's reasonable. Hardly any context switches, hardly any page faults, looks pretty reasonable. And you come down to instructions per cycle and 0.02 is horrid. I mean, that's shocking, I guess, especially with modern CPUs where you're talking uh, super scalar out of order with a, a good um, algorithm. You're hoping to be around one, maybe hoping to be above one, two, three. But if you're down at 0.02, you've got real, real problems. Uh, that's not always the case. I mean, you could have algorithms that are maybe pointer chasers, and basically then you're limited by how long it takes you to get out to memory and back. Too bad. But in a lot of cases, you know, you can kind of get a feel and see what the IPC is doing, and you know you've got issues. You've got some ability to, um, to improve it there. And then it's taken us about 38 seconds, so it's given us a good idea of what's going on. Uh, we can drill down, and this is some of the generic events that perfstat has. And so we have generic translation miss uh, counts and cache miss counts, and they should work across CPUs. This is done on a, a power machine that will work on, say, an x86 box as well. Sky high, so we've got problems everywhere here. So we're taking huge numbers of cache misses and huge numbers of translation misses. Again, there's something probably wrong with our loop here. Uh, time to investigate. So it turns out we're accessing the RAM in the wrong, uh, wrong direction. Instead of accessing it uh, row first, we're accessing it column first. And um, the issue is, we could take a step back and talk a little bit about caches. Caches have cache lines, and they're a, a specific chunk. They might be, say, 64 bytes. They might be 128 bytes. And you pull that whole cache line in when you want to look at data. So if you pull a cache line in, you really want to use the rest of the data instead of throwing it away. If you have your array the wrong way, you basically pull out a piece of information from each cache line and then roll around and do it again. Very inefficient. So in swapping that around, it's gone from 38 seconds to 0.8 seconds or 0.79. Big difference. And, and the IPC now, I'm you know, much more happy with this IPC. I think that's looking pretty good. So you might think, interesting, but that's really a rookie mistake. You know, no one should make a mistake like that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about spec CPU. It's kind of an interesting aside. Um, this is spec CPU 2000s. This was a long time ago. But there was one vendor that got a massive improvement on one of the workloads inside spec CPU from a compiler change. And whenever that happens, the industry's kind of a bit suspicious. You know, what's going on here? Something. Have they broken the benchmark? What are they doing? And it was kind of a fascinating set of circumstances that, so it turned out, that same problem was happening in this benchmark uh, art. So the, uh, it was a two-dimensional uh, array, and it was being accessed in, with a bad footprint, or in a bad, in a bad way. So these are the tricks they did. I, this, this is kind of like fascinating from my perspective, and I'm not a compiler guy, but some of the heroic things that go on just for benchmarks, um, it's kind of interesting. So the first thing is, it was a two-dimensional array allocated dynamically, and in C you might do that by allocating the first dimension, a uh, set of pointers to the, on the first dimension, and then um, allocating the um, second dimension. So the first trick is, is that you have to look at that allocation and decide, I'm going to take all those mallocs and I'm going to replace it by one malloc, and then allocate the array differently. And already that's pretty incredible stuff, because you C's great, and all these pointers and everything, so you've got to do an analysis, an escape analysis, to make sure that no one else is looking at that array. That's only the first step. The second step is, is then you've got to sit back and look at the array and decide, well, I'm actually accessing it backwards, so I've got to swap it. And you might use feedback optimization, or you might use kind of loop heuristics and stuff like that. And even then, that wasn't enough. The third trick was that you took a, a composite structure and you broke it down, because it turned out instead of accessing every field in the structure, you'd access one member. So instead of having this struct, you split it up so that you walk through it in a more compact way. Pretty crazy set of improvements. In fact, uh, we got great research guys. They actually implemented all of this in GCC. Um, and we got a 5x improvement in art, which is pretty crazy. Uh, unfortunately, it's just gone out recently, I heard, because of issues with uh, link time optimizations. But um, the link time optimizations, the global optimizer, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I guess my next rule then is if you want the, the entire hardware and compiler industry to tune your application, just get it into spec CPU. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll keep moving on in perf. As I said, I love perf. Great set of tools. Uh, the next one I'd like to talk about is perf record, this perf record, archive, report, and annotate kind of cycle. 
And this is where you're doing um, exception-based profiling. You're taking addresses and you're taking backtraces and performing, producing a, uh, a set of uh, uh, functions, that top hitters and stuff like that. Uh, record is the one that you use to record, so you give it events and it produces a, an output file. You can use perf archive, which is very useful for embedded systems, so that, uh, that aims to basically look at the profile data and then suck in all of the shared libraries, executables, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's in theory, should work across architectures, 32, 64-bit, big and little endian. Um, it's an interesting, I'll give a plug for, I don't know if Ben's here, Ben's got to talk in endian tomorrow. It's something that everyone gets wrong. Um, we got it wrong again in perf. We've, the mistake was made a long time ago in Linux and it was kind of repeated inside the perf ABI format, so it's a little disappointing. I think there's, it, it tries like four or six ways of trying to work out which exact endianness and bit size you are before it gives up. Perf report is the analysis phase, so we'll, we'll show a quick perf report and, uh, and uh, give you an example there. And then perf annotate is when you drill down and you might do assembly and, and um, source level debugging. So here's a bit of a profile output from a problem we were looking at recently. Uh, it was basically a, a, a copy on write page fault benchmark. So um, well, this is a benchmark I wrote based on something we were seeing in a customer workload. So it's just a simple test case. Well, the first step is get a test case that's representative and then, uh, then analyze it. Uh, and you can see here the top one with a huge, huge percentage of 67% is our copy page routine. So there's probably something we can do there to optimize copy page. Seems like it's the first place we should go. Uh, and the, one of the great things I find out of Perf is, is that you have these, these great backtraces, which second only to, as Stuart was saying, using GDB to backtrace. Uh, it's probably the best tool you can get. It does rely on a lot of things in terms of frame pointers. Um, there's uh, some <laughs> tricks going on to be able to dump entire parts of the stack and backtrace it. It's, it's somewhat of a difficult problem because we actually do the backtraces in the kernel, so we really don't want a full dwarf based uh, backtrace engine in the kernel, I think. Uh, and then the patch, that, you know, the, a lot of the time, once you work out where it is, the patch, I, would, I was gonna say write itself, it doesn't quite write itself, but <laughs> it's, it's usually you know, obvious what you have to do, and there we managed to bring it uh, up by about 17% with a, with, a, with a change to copy page. So we added some uh, special prefetch instructions and a few other things. So once we knew what the problem was, off we go and fix it. Next one I want to talk about is all the in-kernel tracing. There's a lot of in-kernel tracing that's quite useful. Um, it all lives in, in debugfs, which is becoming maybe a bit of a dumping ground for stuff, but it's in there. Um, one of them is kernel trace points. So there's the ability to have these lightweight trace points that, and, and they are actually quite lightweight now with some of the new stuff in, uh, that has gone in recently. When they're not enabled, they're quite lightweight. When they're on, they can be extremely heavyweight. And they're added by kernel developers. Someone decides this is a good place to put a, 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 a trace point. They might decide an XFS, he needs one here, so that goes in and then basically anyone can exercise it and anyone can use it. Uh, system calls as well, so you could trace system calls through that if you wanted to. The other one is ftrace. ftrace is a bunch of traces. Uh, the immediate one that I think of that's quite useful is the, um, the function tracer. That isn't enabled by default because it's somewhat of a heavyweight trace function, but it allows you basically to get an in-kernel trace function by function in and out. So for someone who doesn't really understand how the kernel works maybe, or doesn't understand where the performance problem is, you can turn that on, basically look through the trace and it'll tell you which functions you're bouncing through, gives you a good idea of, of, of how the kernel is operating, what it's doing. Um, here, I've just used a context switch trace point, just as an example. You can use them directly in SysFS. Perf also has a wrapper around it, so you can use perf to enable these and dump them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and here we're just seeing, looks like bash is, is context switching in and out with a, uh, a kernel work thread. So just a simple example. They're very easy to make. So if you have uh, you know, a driver or something like that and you, you think you want to sprinkle it with debug print case, uh, another option is create some trace points that you can enable when you need to. Um, you could say it's a little bit cleaner. 
the other trick is is sometimes you can also you also you can also uh, link to them in kernel modules. So if you decide you want to build something that traces and, and analyzes and all that kind of stuff, and you can only do it in the kernel, you can actually link to the trace points, which we've done in the past. That's the function graph. So this is just a system read, uh, read from a pipe, simple stuff, but it gives you all the functions you've gone through as you call. So the system call as you enter, right through to checking to see if the area of memory is clear, or, or from a security point of view, if you should be able to write to that area of memory. And then you do the pipe read, and there's a, a lock and hard lock. So basically, you, you've already got your complete path through the kernel, which is, which is nice to see. QMU is another great tool, because then you can trace all the way through user space and kernel and get a, a full assembly, dis, you know, disassembly. Uh, we use that quite a lot as well. Love LD preload. I think, uh, I think Stuart might have been talking about lib eat my data I heard yesterday, which is, is, a, is it an LD preload hack or? Yeah. Love it, yep. You do anything with LD preload within reason and uh, we've been known to. <laughs> so especially with applications that maybe you don't have the source to at the time uh, or it's just difficult to rebuild, you can just add this shim in and pretty much do anything, confuse, hide uh, from the application, anything you want to. This was in my junk code directory. We had an application years ago that just had an arbitrary limit on the number of processes. No reason at all. We bring up a new machine and it had 1,024 threads and this thing would just not run. It's like, well, what the hell's going on? And it was obvious it was calling sysconf and then buffing out after it. So the trick is you can just lay yourself between sysconf. Um, simple stuff, so you can, you can link, link into the next, next guy. So you link back into sysconf in the library, but just intercept it. So if we ask for the number of processes, we just get it from an environment variable, and we can keep going. <laughs> Love LD preload. Last one, when all else fails, nothing else is working, the machine's catatonic, you're in trouble, what are we gonna do? Um, well, this, this, is, this is really you know, the last ditch effort. Unfortunately, Sysrec isn't, well, it isn't enabled because it's, it's really a bit of a perform, uh, security risk if you just had random machines enabling all the, all the Sysrec uh, ability, you can do a bunch of things, you can kill tasks and all this kind of stuff. Um, but if you are fighting a very nasty problem, it's a good way to, to, to try and get an idea of what's going on if you can't log into it. Uh, and this one here is a machine, backtrace I found from somewhere. It's pretty obvious we've got problems. We're trying to execute a process, PMD alloc, we're allocating a page table entry in the, the uh, MMU code, and then we, f we block Obviously, the memory isn't available. We've, we're in D state. You look at this and think, okay, we're in trouble. We don't have enough memory. It's basically the problem. So it at least allows you to kind of get a, a last, last stitch effort to try and understand what the hell is going on. Uh, more miscellaneous tools. Uh, Perf script is kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's the ability to use Python and Perl based scripts inside of Perf, which is quite powerful. So there's a bunch of maybe 15 to 20 different perf scripts at the moment for doing various things. One of them's system call top, so you can just like top, but it'll show you system call numbers per second. Um, there's other ones to do per process read and write, um, breakdowns, all that kind of stuff. Perf lock, if you think you've got a, a kernel locking problem, perf lock is what you want to use. Uh, perf trace is the one I was talking about earlier that in theory will, will allow you to, to, you, to produce a lot of the same metrics that something like S trace provides and potentially a lot lighter weight too because it's basically it's all happening in kernel. Um, the P trace interface is pretty pretty damn inefficient uh, that, that S trace uses. A bunch of block <coughs> tools. Um, Yen Zexpo has got his block trace so you can basically if you think you've got a IO scheduler issue you can trace uh, trace what's happening in the kernel in terms of uh, IO um, and that was I was going to say recently, but a while ago, ported on top of trace points. So he's using that generic trace points functionality to provide um, to provide that block trace tool. Bunch of networking tools, the usual netstat, TCP dump, Wireshark, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Stuart mentioned GDB, love GDB, and we've used that in anger a number of times, definitely. Uh, LSO, Veltrace, uh, do a lot of binary patching, especially we had a, we had a. a a lit I was going to say a litany of, of applications that decided they wanted to look at proc CPU info and look at the number of CPUs. And again, more than 64, can't handle it. I'm out of here. So binary patch that string to temp 
CPU info underscore or something like that. Put your own CPU info in. It's just easier than modifying the kernel, right? <laughs> uh, task set and Numa control. It's always good to try and drag the program back to something more simple and, and easier to understand. Uh, in a lot of cases with workloads that are bouncing around, it might be hard to see exactly what's going on. You can lock those guys down to a particular core, a particular thread, make the problem a bit simpler. Finally, load generators. Again, Jens has got a tool, uh, FIO, which is great for uh, basically having a repeatable way of replaying workloads, IO workloads, so that if you're trying to analyze a problem, you've got a way to produce that, that, uh, that IO. And Trig has got some great tiny little tools called SOC Sync and SOC Source, which is just for doing like a TCP kind of socket. And it's much simpler than a lot of the other benchmarks. So you basically just get down to socket here, socket there, data comes across, you know, where my problem. Second diversion. Um, in my years at IBM, I get, I get a lot of weird bug reports. This was probably one of the weirdest, I mean, one of the most interesting uh, tools that I've seen used. Uh, they had a comp compute benchmark, and it was basically running a uh, you know, compute benchmark on one core, and they came to me and said, there's a Linux scheduler problem, you've got to fix it. And uh, I didn't exactly say prove it, but I said prove it. And they sent, they sent me this, this, this output, and they said, we're pretty sure it's a problem at your end, please fix. And what it actually was, was a thermal map of a CPU and they sent me that and they said, something is moving on that chip. <laughs> Please fix. <laughs> so yeah, it's basically an XY map of a thermal map of, of what's happening on a multi-core chip. And so obviously we've got a problem. This compute benchmark is bouncing around where you'd hope it was sitting in one spot. So that was pretty interesting. This is where things kind of get messy because up until now, it's been fairly easy to isolate a problem and try and work out what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, you know, these application guys are conspiring to make life more and more difficult for us. So Java makes life quite difficult. You no longer have this static mapping of an instruction address to an opcode, to an instruction. Uh, it's Because obviously it's just in time compiled. So you have to have a way of linking, of providing the information at runtime. Um, the open source JVMs have a much better way of doing this, but if you're working with some of the vendor ones, for example, the IBM one, you actually link in a shared library to the JVM. It's pretty hard stuff. And so I've got a quick thing there just to, to, to link it in, uh, to create that uh, object file for perf so that you can do at least function level profiling. The other issue is things like garbage collection. So garbage collection can be quite nasty. Um, you could talk to Paul probably for hours about all the real time issues with Java garbage collection. Um, but, it, but it consu you know, it's consuming a lot of CPU. It also creates stalls. Uh, we find a lot of performance problems there. It can be quite difficult to understand. Uh, at least then, if you're using something like perf record, you can actually usually see what's the, the, the functions in the JVM that are garbage collecting. So you kind of have an idea. If you're spending 40% of your time garbage collecting, it's probably something you need to tweak. It's probably an issue you need to fix. But if you're spending 5%, you're probably OK. The other, way, the other part where it's quite difficult is um, interpreted languages. So this is, I think, an area of weakness generally with our tools. Uh, some of the, the scripting languages, Python and Perl, have their own profilers. Not too bad. But when it comes to doing higher level profiling, say with something like Perf, Perf's not going to give you anything useful, uh, unfortunately. Things also make it work we, at worst. We, we spent some time, a number of spent some time looking at OpenStack recently, and um, it was very difficult to debug and understand. I'll just say that. Um, it uses user space coroutines. And back in 12 years ago, <coughs> the all the rage in uh, pthreads uh, threading libraries with this m to n model. So you'd have m kernel threads and n user space threads, and you have a user space scheduler. Um, that's really a road to madness. It's just so difficult to understand, it's so difficult to look at it from a high level perspective, a profiling tool, and know what's going on. None of the user space context switches really get surfaced up to the tools. So when you start adding these user space coroutine and, and, and threading things, things get really difficult. 
The other one is hypervisors, and this is another area that's becoming incredibly difficult to, to debug. Um, I mentioned stolen time, so we added user, we had user, system, idle, soft IQ, hard IQ, nice. We added stolen. So we've got what, seven. Stolen is basically the time you should have had that the hypervisor took away from you. So you need a metric to know that I didn't actually get all the time I was given, that's stolen time. And it gets really difficult now because you've got stacked schedulers. So all of a sudden you've got a scheduler on top of a scheduler and you do things potentially in user space and the guest kernel that may not, um, may not behave as well. Um, one of them's, one word for it is multi-tiered locking. The, some locking primitives, um, I see this a lot in big um, applications, I won't mention any names, but they decide that they're better at locking than the kernel, so they actually have this multi-tier locking. They decide that we'll spin for a while, then we'll try for a while, and then finally we'll call a blocking primitive. So that's kind of multi-tier locking. Um, when your X level's deep and you're busy looping, in a lot of busy looping for another CPU that isn't necessarily even running, you're just wasting your time. So we see a lot of this kind of stuff. And it just gets worse with hypervisors now because you've got two levels of this going. The other one, an interesting one, is turbo mode. A lot of the vendors now have turbo mode. Things go faster sometimes. So they, they don't sit at nominal frequency. They might be a 3.2 gig CPU, but they might burst higher than that. How do you expose this? And we don't really have any good ways of exposing it. A lot of the tools aren't, aren't happy at all if you burst above 100. What does it even mean? But what, what's the opposite? Do you make nominal like 90%? then you get complaints from people saying, I'm not using all my CPU. So, so it's one of those things where the tools aren't great and uh, there's no real good answer. Threading makes it even more difficult. So uh, we call it simultaneous multi-threading, Intel call it hyper-threading, but the ability for one CPU core to have multiple threads of execution, all of a sudden then run-to-run -run repeatability could go out the window because you could have something random on another thread on the same core. It might run twice as fast one time and and twice as slow the next time. Uh, and what we tend to do is try to lock that problem down, just look at it from a single thread perspective. Just talking about this multi-tiered locking, um, if you look at anything like this, the first thing you notice is, is that these applications are just pounding on this thing called sched yield, and it's a horrible thing. Never use sched yield. If you ever think it's a good idea, it's not. Don't use it. Uh, but we find with these, these applications that they'll tend to use sched yield in this area where they're kind of busy looping. They haven't quite decided that they want to block and stop. So they're going to sched yield for a while. And what happens is from scheduler to scheduler version, someone tweaks something tiny, and the whole way that sched yield kind of operates changes, and these benchmarks or workloads vary wildly. So avoid it. Um, the other trick is, is if you see kernel futex issues, even if you see a bunch of time in the kernel, it's often actually not a kernel futex issue often not a kernel issue, it's not even often a p thread library issue, it's usually a, maybe a locking issue in the application. And we've got tools like perfscript, futex contention to kind of try and drill on that. Uh, the final one here is watch out for negative scaling. Um, working for a hardware vendor, we always like to sell more hardware, but it's a bit embarrassing if you sell more hardware and the performance drops. So you, you really want to know that what you're, you're operating in a, in a positive scaling area and you understand the problem and that throwing more hardware at the problem is actually going to help and not hinder things. So I thought I'd finish maybe with a top 10 performance mistakes. Maybe not the top 10, but the, the top 10 I could think of at the time. First is not having a representative test case, obviously. So the first step is, is that you need something that represents reality uh, I'm always, well, I shouldn't say always, I have been guilty of this in the past as well. So I get a, I get a um, cut down test case from a customer or something, look at it and say, oh, I know exactly what that is, go off and fix it, kernel patch, get it merged, and the vendor tries it, does nothing. Wasted my time. The second step is obviously completing that analysis, so even if you do have the right test case, you may not understand why it's failing. So what you want to do is go in and analyze it first. Let's just throw more hardware at the problem. Doesn't always work. In fact, often with some workloads, less hardware performs better. Our algorithm is better than the obvious one. Um, Radio had a comment yesterday saying, 
that uh, she wished more people in the industry hated computers. I wish uh, more people in the industry feared complexity. I think in a lot of cases, a lot of people like to do complex things that aren't always the right idea, uh, may have corner cases that people don't understand and break down in awful and horrible ways. So if you are looking at, it, looking at something and replacing an algorithm with something different, more complex, not as common, really take a step back and, un and understand if you should, if it is giving the performance improvements you want and the trade-off does make sense. Let's just put it in user space. I see Stephen here. <laughs> There's always a rush. The kernel's difficult or the kernel's slow. Let's get it in user space. Um, in Stephen's talk, he talked a bit about uh, you know, where you want to be operating in terms of, say, packets per second and packet size. If you're not in that, that bleeding edge, stay away from those things. Again, road to madness. Let's just put it in the kernel. <laughs> That's the other problem. You have something in user space that really doesn't have any performance issues, who really cares? Maybe a random USB drive or something like that. It doesn't need to go in the kernel. We don't need to make it go faster. <laughs> Writing your Malloc library. Thank thankfully, this doesn't happen as much as it used to. Um, glibc for a while wasn't accepting maybe as many Malloc patches, performance improvements as it should have. Uh, things like pooled allocators and stuff. So it really had some big issues with threading. Uh, it's got better recently, so not as many people do that. But if you're thinking of doing it, again, bad idea. Go write a window manager or something instead. <laughs> <laughs> doing your own locking. That's the other one. Everyone thinks locking isn't, how hard could it be? I'll just write my own. They always get it, they always get it wrong. I mean, that's just, again, you will make a mistake and it will bite you at the worst time. It'll be, it'll be an awful to debug issue or it'll be fail in production or something like that. There's plenty of things. I mean, there's glibc built-ins, there's pthread locking, pthread libraries, obviously, all of the primitives in pthreads, locking libraries, whatever, stay away from writing around locking, especially if it's got pthread, if it's got a sked yield or something, those kind of things, stay away. Benchmark specific hacks, another one, you know, we tempt to stay away from, but you know, some, sometimes creep in. And finally, again, the answer is never, we need more sked yield. So with that, any questions? <laughs>